This is the fifth in our great adventures along the Silk Road. And tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome a very distinguished historian, Lester K. Little, the Dwight W. Morrow Professor Emeritus of History from Smith College. Professor Little is a former director of the American Academy in Rome, a past president of the American Academy, uh, at the Medieval Academy of America, and also a past president of the International Union of Institutes of Archaeology, Art History, and History in Rome. From 2000 to 2005, he served on the board of directors of the Commission for Educational and Cultural Exchange between Italy and the United States. He's a specialist in the social history of religion and religious movements in the European Middle Ages. His principal publications include Nature, Man, and Society, Religious, pov religious Poverty and the Profit Economy in Medieval Europe, Liberty, Charity, Fraternity, Lay Religious Confraternities at Bergamo in the Age of the Commune, and Benedictine Maledictions. But his most recent book has been in a very different direction, which is why we invited him tonight. Plague and the End of Antiquity, the Pandemic of 541 to 750, a Cambridge University Press volume, which is a new deadly tra travel companion of trade routes and of our Silk Road in particular. Professor. Thank you, Mr. Director. My thanks go also to my friend, Professor Brian Rose of this university, because together, uh, Richard Hodges and uh, Brian Rose have uh, extended this invitation for me to be with you here this evening. There's a cliche that's come into my mind when I entered this room. Forgive the cliche part of it, but it calls for a personal remark. When I saw this space, and I saw the organ pipes, there was a little bit that feeling of having died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I love organ music. I cannot play an organ or any other instrument. I do not know how to read music. But I've justified putting off all of those things in this life because that's what I plan to do in my next life. <laughs> so here we almost are. It couldn't be any better there, I'm sure, than it is here. Now, that's a pretty grim subject. And um, there are times when Perhaps at dinner parties, people ask me what I'm working on, and if my wife is close enough to nudge me a little bit, or else if she's across the table to kind of look at me with that, don't go on too much about the plague over dinner. <laughs> but I think we really should um, you know, look at those figures up on top and loosen up a little bit. I mean, if now we had some music that came on that had a good beat, I mean, let's have a good time and enjoy it. And maybe there is a kind of preview in that late medieval print of what goes on at funerals in New Orleans. Who knows? But since uh, we are going to be uh, travel companions ourselves for the next hour, I want to begin by setting out a few guidelines. First of all, with the word play. It's used extensively as a simile, sometimes as a metaphor, um, such as, when you meet my parents, avoid any mention of religion like the plague. Right? Or, or we could say, uh, most, of this, most of us in this economy, and I do mean most, but not all of us, um, have been made to suffer from a plague of subprime loans. It's also used as a synonym for epidemic, 
and of practically any infectious disease. This becomes a little confusing when one re refers to the AIDS plague, which really means simply the AIDS epidemic. Well, you can just put aside all such uses for this hour together, anyway, because in speaking of plague, I shall be speaking only of a specific disease, also commonly called bubonic plague, or in scientific parlance, Yersinia pestis, Y-E-R-S-I-N-I-A. Now for second guideline. Historians have condensed the history of plague into convenient shorthand by grouping together thousands of epidemics into three great pandemics. If we use epidemic to describe, say, an outbreak in one city or in a reasonably uh, limited region, then a pandemic would instead, and it's quite obvious, isn't it, would be spread out over a vast area. If you think of the flu of 1918, uh, that's probably the great pandemic of all time. It was truly worldwide. But pandemic can also have a chronological dimension, chronological as well as geographical, as we will see. Because the first plague pandemic, referred to in the, uh, the book title uh, that uh, Richard Hodges just mentioned, the first plague pandemic is called the Plague of Justinian, or sometimes the Justinianic pandemic that lasted from 541 to 750 AD. Bears the name of the Roman Emperor in whose reign it broke out, and then spread through much of the Middle East and Europe. That was the first and is by far the least well-known pandemic, albeit it lasted for 210 years and witnessed the transformation of the Roman Empire into the Byzantine Empire, the eclipse of the Persian, Persian Empire, the birth of Islam, and the spectacular rise and expansion of the Arab Empire. The second pandemic is the one that we've all heard about, namely the so-called Black Death. Although many historians restrict this name to the massive mortality throughout Europe between 1347 and 1352, this is really a very short-sighted view. The name can also, though, stand for a much larger pandemic. Now, to be fair to the makers of this map, we can say their goal was simply to show the spread of plague in Europe, and they've included a strip of uh, North Africa and the very eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. However, the same pandemic engulfed all of the Middle East. In fact, it lasted longer there than it did in Europe. And, uh, of course, uh, it came from Central Asia in the 1330s, and then subsequently spread through Europe and the Middle East, starting in the 40s, and it made frequent returns for over four centuries in Europe, and even more, as I said, in the Near East. We don't really normally use Black Death to refer to all of that, but as I say, it seems to me we need somehow to expand our notion of it to realize that plague was around for all of those centuries, through the Renaissance, through the age of the Protestant Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, the Copernican Revolution, and not least uh, the period of uh, the expansion of Europe uh, into the New World. Well, the third pandemic, thus far nameless, began in Hong Kong in 1894. Since the middle of the 19th century, the disease had been moving slowly eastwards across southern China for half a century. Once it arrived in Hong Kong, it took only half a decade to reach major ports, including Honolulu and San Francisco, all over the globe. And yes, my fellow Americans, we harbor that famous visitor in our country, now found in the 11 westernmost states of our republic. Since it is currently moving eastward at about 25 miles a year, there's very little likelihood that it will reach Pennsylvania in the lifetime of anyone, even the youngest person in this room. Still, 
back at the third pandemic. In India alone, during the first three decades of the 20th century, the disease killed some 12 million people. So, to sum up these uh, guidelines, plague refers to a particular disease, Yersinia pestis, and historians have condensed its history into three main episodes. From 541 to 750, from the middle of the 14th century to the late 18th and even early 19th century in the Middle East, and then the outbreak of 1894 in Hong Kong that lasted uh, up until uh, about the middle of the 20th century, let's say after World War II. The problem that I would like to deal with today <clears throat> is how and from where did these pandemics get started? I should specify where did the first two of these pandemics, because the origins of the third one uh, really present no, no problem. I've already told you, from southern China, moved to Hong Kong, and then spread uh, all over. However, in connection with uh, Hong Kong, it was clear to any well-informed person that plague was about to meet the steamship for the very first time. <coughs> that it did, and with the monumental consequences that uh, I've started to mention to you already moments ago. But when we move back to the second pandemic, all of this is not quite so clear. There's some consensus, but its basis is a mixture of bits and pieces of evidence. And so there is much more that we would really like to know about where it started, and just how it was transmitted and where, what the route was that it took. Here again uh, is um, a map drawn specifically for uh, the Black Death. Um, it is though helpful uh, to see that um, the, uh, we begin in the Crimean Peninsula here uh, and then it moves down to Constantinople, and then it immediately goes to the great ports of uh, Alexandria, and uh, comes around to Messina, and uh, this uh, sends it off into Europe, and uh, this uh, which is where it sends it off into uh, the Middle East. We can work further back uh, from the Crimean Peninsula. And here's one of the uh, Silk Road maps. That is by, I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself there. Um, that is, it came uh, to, there's the Black Sea there, so it just, it passes over the Caspian Sea, and um, its route really has been traced back uh, to this region, and uh, as it moves into um, Manchuria here and on into China, uh, the evidence begins just to evaporate. It's that that I'm trying to get at. Is there some way that we can know more about um, where it started and how it was transmitted? Now, this uh, northern route uh, is uh, the sort of last major important uh, phase in the history of the Silk Road. It was the major artery for international trade and communication in the 13th and 14th centuries. Remember that the Mongols had conquered uh, and put together, as it were, all of Eurasia in the uh, early 13th century. And uh, so um, the Franciscan missionaries of the 1240s and 50s uh, traveled that route spread Christianity to these new, newly contacted peoples in the East. They were followed by the Polo brothers, merchants of Venice, who first went to China in the 1260s, and again in the following decade with their son and nephew, Marco. It was the main route then that connected the Italian trading posts in the Black Sea. Uh, both the Venetians and the Genoese uh, had uh, entrepôt uh, in the Black Sea connecting uh, that with Peking. But as I say, we lose sight of the plague as we move uh, further eastwards. We know still less about the origins of the first pandemic. 
It arrived completely unannounced in the Mediterranean Basin in 541. It arrived specifically at the port of Pelusium in Egypt. Pelusium is located on the eastern edge of the Nile Delta, slightly east of more modern Port Said. And this argues for the disease of perhaps having come up through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Suez. But as for where it came from to reach the Red Sea, the arguments then can be made for its uh, having come perhaps from East Africa or perhaps from across the Indian Ocean. So far, there doesn't seem to be uh, any way to uh, resolve this. One can uh, imagine uh, this uh, could be an overland route. Uh, I'll show you in a little while the ships that travel the naval uh, or maritime version of the Silk Road. Uh, it could as well have come uh, that way. So the question I'm asking, put in slightly different terms, are what role did the Silk Road play, if any, in the first pandemic, and how can we extend further our understanding of its role in launching the second one? To get at the answers, let me start by posing another question. How do we know that plague was the disease involved in these pandemics? We have to start the answer again in Hong Kong in 1894. The outbreak at this time rendered possible not only Plague's first encounter with the steamship, but its first ever rendezvous with the new science of medical microbiology. Disciples of the two leading schools of this science, those of Louis Pasteur in Paris and of Robert Koch, it's K O C H, at Berlin, rushed to Hong Kong to be the first to identify the plague pathogen. Nice scene of uh, Koch, not in his uh, laboratory in Berlin, but uh, obviously uh, this it was in India, I believe, uh, in the first decade of, of the 20th century. Pasteur's name is uh, obviously a household term, literally. Um, that of Koch um, is a name uh, known surely to medical students, at the very least. He's known for his postulates, which state the conditions for proving that a given parasite or microorganism directly causes a given disease. First, the parasite must be isolated from the diseased organism and shown to grow in a pure culture. Second, it must be consistently present and in characteristic form and arrangement. Third, it must be shown to induce the disease experimentally by being injected into a healthy animal. Think of various kinds of guinea pigs. Now, both of uh, the European trained competitors were uh, in East Asia at the time. On the right, you see Shibasaburo Kitasato who had worked with Koch in Berlin from 1886 to 91. He was then director of a bacteriological institute in Tokyo. Meanwhile, Alexandre Yevsen, a Swiss-born naturalized citizen who had worked at the Pasteur Institute, was a medical officer in the colonial service in Indochina. They arrived nearly simultaneously at Hong Kong and each one identified the plague pathogen within a very few days of its arrival. They didn't cooperate at all. In fact, there was some of what, uh, if you recall, the term we used back in the time of the Nixon administration, dirty tricks involved, uh, trying to make it difficult for their competition. Kitsato, I think, so identified himself with the Berlin School that we can practically see some remnants here also of the Franco-German divide. Uh, think of the uh, Franco-German War of 1870, uh, and uh, we're about halfway between that and the outbreak of World War I. Uh, I think relations at all levels, including those of very high scientific achievement, uh, were involved. Well, colleagues in the field regarded the 
virtually independent discovery dates as so close that they preferred to honor both men. But it turned out that, um, this is, um, reading carefully, Kinesato's later detailed articles about uh, his discoveries, um, it was found he made a number of serious errors, and it's for that that Yersan was given the honor of having the plague pathogen named for him, hence Yersinia. More important, from that day to this, the only definitive way to know whether someone has plague or whether someone died of the plague is to get a positive lab report for the presence of Yersinia. From that day to this, a doctor's diagnosis is a hypothesis, but proof has to come from a lab. Now, more than the identification of the pathogen came out of Hong Kong. After all, being the first to identify a disease does bring honor, to be sure, but it would be really a quite empty academic honor if that's all there were to it. Of course, Yersin and others got to work right away trying to figure out, first of all, where did the pathogen come from? That is, how do human beings get this disease? Secondly, how to make a vaccine, that's how to prevent it, and thirdly, how to develop a cure. A French colleague uh, working in Bombay in the late 1890s uncovered the rat, rat flea Yersinia nexus. That is uh, the significant uh, fact that uh, the, the rat harbors a flea who uh, contains uh, this uh, Yersinia, and uh, as rats tend always to live in quite close proximity to human beings, uh, there is a danger at times for the rat flea, for a combination of circumstances, to uh, move over to a less appealing subject. Uh, but nonetheless, if there's not enough rat blood around, then uh, they need it badly. They'll take a human being's blood if they have to. With consequences. <laughs> now, this means that plague is not normally a contagious disease. Because in order to get it, uh, you have to have a, you know, the right kind of flea bite you and inject you with it. Um, which is at least a curiosity because uh, for uh, some centuries uh, one of the various terms used for the disease was the contagion. But also uh, we should uh, point out that this had obvious, uh, the, the, the role of the rat uh, had obvious uh, public health uh, implications as you can imagine. As for vaccines, many of them uh, have been developed over the slightly more than a century. Uh, since the discovery of the pathogen, with varying degrees of success. Uh, none of these has been fully satisfactory. They all have drawbacks so far, anyway. And the same was true of cures for half a century, but uh, once uh, antibiotics were developed in the middle of the 20th century, um, that was no longer an issue. They tend to be very effective so long as the diagnosis is timely and supplies of the antibiotics uh, uh, available. Coming back to the need for a laboratory confirmation of diagnoses, in effect, as far as plague is concerned, since 1894, we now need to ask, all right, how do we know, perhaps we should be a little more cautious, on what basis do we claim that Yersinia was involved in the two earlier, pre-1894 pandemics? Well, we do what all historians do, or are supposed to do. We base our understanding of the past upon our reading of written evidence. In the case of outbreaks of disease, we attempt to make retroactive or retrospective diagnoses. But we have no way of getting confirmation from a laboratory. And there are other limitations, that is, when we try to make a diagnosis. The trouble with practically all disease descriptions from remote historical periods is that they are not specific <coughs> enough in describing symptoms. They give us a clear indication of 
what disease may be involved. The one symptom we can virtually always find is mention of fever, but that's not very helpful because all infectious diseases involve fever. If you have an infection, you have a fever. Uh, even a little tiny one will at least you know, create a, a, a terrific a localized uh, sensation of heat as well as uh, pain. It so happens, however, that uh, here's an indication on the, on the left, uh, which actually begins with uh, symptoms up there with uh, the fever. It so happens that Yersinia, Yersinia usually, not always, uh, has a very distinctive symptom, and that is the bubo, bubo, which gives the name bubonic, which is a swelling of one of the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are located, uh, I think I have another image coming up here. Yeah, there you are, in the armpit. Uh, a little less sensationally than that, uh, on the neck, just below the ear, uh, or uh, in the groin. And uh, it's on the uh, high up on the inner part of the thigh. To be discreet, I'll show you a saint who had I'm sorry, there is a photo, so we're not so discreet. Um, there we are. This is Saint Roche, or Saint Rocco, and um, his, one of his thighs is always exposed, and there are thousands of paintings of him. And um, just in case you don't get the idea, he's usually pointing uh, at uh, this uh, lesion uh, in his leg. And uh, he's even got a friend who says, if you really don't think that, they take a look at this. Uh, and um, while we're at it, it's not really pertinent to our story, but um, Rocco uh, spent some time um, off in, in the woods uh, as, as a hermit. And um, he was cared for by his uh, local dog who fed him. And here he is bringing a, a loaf of bread to him. It's nice in saint stories. They're often uh, the, uh, the hermits um, have to have somebody bring them food, and it's nice if it's a, a crow or, in this case, a dog. And so on. Now, the first. Uh, unmistakable uh, descriptions of uh, buboes uh, come in the Mediterranean world in the 540s. And this will immediately tell you that this is why historians say the first historically documented pandemic of plague is the one that begins in 541 AD. And most famously in the writings of Justinian's court historian Procopius. But mention of these symptoms appear not just in Greek sources, but also in sources written in Syriac, Arabic, and Latin. Similarly, when we get to the Black Death in the 14th century, we find mention of buboes in dozens and dozens of texts. In, of course, by, now, by then, many more languages, because the various uh, uh, vulgar uh, languages uh, are becoming uh, written down for our precious sources. These far more precious sources from the 14th or 18th centuries frequently give us indications, though, of another form taken by the disease, which you've probably all heard of, namely pneumonic rather than bubonic plague. In those cases where that poison gets into a person's lungs, it multiplies extremely fast and kills within a matter of hours. If it does take more than a day, it surely doesn't take two days. Whereas bubonic plague, untreated, as it was in pre-modern societies, bubonic plague has a mortality rate of about 50%. Up or down. And usually after um, five or six days, maximum 10 days, um, you get a decision. Plague works very quickly. And um, until the last, um, 
one doesn't know really which way it's going to go. Uh, some people die, about half, let's say, and the other half uh, have that terrific liberation. I think the closest we come to it uh, is when uh, we just, in a rather very brief moment, recover from the flu, let's say, and wow, a rush of energy, and uh, uh, we don't you know, feel all the aches and pains and, uh, and and the fever and so on, um, and we get on with uh, with life, and that's the end. I started by saying, whereas bubonic plague, pneumonic plague has a mortality rate of a hundred percent. Not only, but unlike the bubonic form, pneumonic plague is highly contagious. The lungs fill up with the poison, forcing the person to cough and sneeze. You're probably familiar with stroboscopic, stroboscopic photography. Uh, so you've uh, probably seen uh, images uh, of this sort. For example, uh, there's a famous one of milk being poured into a glass from a pitcher. And it's the surface of the milk, and you can actually see the drops of it, which are bouncing up, say, captured by this high-speed uh, photography. Well, in this context, uh, here is a photo of a man sneezing. Uh, he is actually not holding his hand with a handkerchief so close as to block it, and therefore you can see uh, a cloud of droplets of tens or maybe there are hundreds of thousands of droplets. And if those droplets contain Yersinia, then anyone who's too close to that cloud takes it directly into the mouth and throat and then lungs and will very soon be meeting the person who sneezed in the next world. I have to say, I think of this time, of this every time I hear a person sneeze in a crowded subway car or an airplane. Now, I don't want to traumatize you, but... <laughs> and I think of it too when I read the account of a monastery in Yorkshire in which 40 of the 50 monks, including the abbot, died within a very, very short number of days. Think of late medieval paintings showing the death of a saint where the saint is, is laid out uh, dying on a bed in a room with a low ceiling and is completely surrounded by the other members of the community who are, who are praying. And alas for them, if the saint has mnemonic play, uh, they're also breathing. Um, it's absolutely frightening, but completely believable. Uh, they certainly wouldn't isolate. Uh, it's interesting, monasteries do have infirmaries, and they do isolate uh, the sick to a certain extent. They did in the 12th century begin to have hospitals also in civic society, in cities. And uh, so in that sense, did some isolation, but up to a point. Uh, but when a holy figure is dying, and particularly in the close-knit religious family of a monastery, whether Monastery of men and monastery of women. Uh, of course, they are all very close uh, to be with that person at the very end, and there is nothing more dangerous to do, of course, uh, in the case of demonic plague. All right, so we can be quite sure from the descriptions we read that Yersinia was present in each of the first two pandemics. It is strange that both Kitisato and Yersa, the very ones who established a new scientific way of defining the disease happened in the very first papers that they wrote about their discovery in mankind, said, this is clearly the same disease as the old bubonic plague, uh, which uh, you know, killed so many people centuries ago in, uh, in Europe uh, and uh, in Asia. Now, not everyone agrees with them uh, or with the historians who have gone right on all through the 20th century following them, saying that the Black Death was plagued and that the Justinianic 
player was truly Yersin. In 1970, a lone British historian challenged the notion that the Black Death was really Yersinia, and this because he had noted differences between mortality rates in that pandemic and what he had read and understood about the uh, 20th century post-Hong Kong uh, outbreak of plague, especially in India. We come back to India often, by the way, because there is a very, very traditional society, very, very poor, uh, but with an overlay of British colonial administration. So the odd situation of one kind of a society, but uh, a almost compulsive uh, record-keeping uh, governmental structure about it. So uh, we, we get these reports uh, that we normally wouldn't get, say, and haven't gotten in front of the past of uh, traditional societies. Some other uh, scholars joined this uh, critique uh, beginning in the 1980s. And uh, they also were noting discrepancies between the modern experience uh, with the disease and their understanding of the Black Death. One of these suggested, well, it must be anthrax. Another one put forward an Ebola-like hemorrhagic disease that's no longer around. Um, and still another one um, refused to put forward an alternative, but he simply claimed the Black Death in Europe was any disease but the rat-based bubonic plague. Now, it's interesting that these critics of retroactive diagnosis had in common with its defenders their reliance upon written sources. And although uh, they did not attract many converts, uh, they did uh, raise serious objections that gave pause to most historians who deal with these matters. We began to wonder, yes, and now I'm not completely convinced, but it seems to me that um, you know, they've got a point, they have shown these differences, and then the result, though, has been for many people to shrug their shoulders and say, we'll never, we'll never know. I mean, there's just no way we can know. In 1998, a group of five molecular biologists at the Faculty of Medicine at Marseille published an article in English under this title, Detection of 400-year-old Yersinia pestis DNA in human dental pulp. An approach, is still going on, an approach to the diagnosis of ancient septicemia. They began by pointing out that several different diseases had been put forth as explanations of great mortalities of the past. And yet, while many mass grave sites were either known or suspected suspected to exist. The lack of a proper method for detecting pathogens in very old human remains had prevented the making of precise microbiological identifications of the agents of those mortalities. Now here's the hypothesis of the Marseille scholars. The dental pulp of teeth should be a lasting refuge of Yersinia pestis and would be a suitable material in which to base molecular detection of the bacteria. Here is why. Since blood poisoning or septicemia has normally set in by the time plague victims are dying, all tissues supplied with blood, including dental pulp, can be expected to contain traces of Yersinia. They had two mass graves in the region where they are, in Provence. Both of them used, according to historical records, to bury victims from plague quarantine hospitals. One of these was from Marseille itself in 1722, the other from uh, a site uh, dated back to 1590. And by the way, the, the date of 1590 explains the title phrase that said 400-year-old Yersinia. So they took uh, teeth uh, from a certain number of the skeletons from each of these uh, sites. That is, they x-rayed the skulls, uh, they extracted the teeth, they fractured them longitudinally, and recovered uh, a fine white powder, which was the remains of blood. 
And uh, from this, they were able to extract DNA. They announced the positive identification of Yersinia in most of these teeth and in none of the control teeth they took from the same time but from a completely different kind of burial site. So their hypothesis of the suitability of uh, examining using teeth uh, and the presence of Yersinia uh, was, in their view, confirmed. They were ready very soon, just two years later, with the results of another investigation in which they pushed back their method to the middle of the 14th century, that is, to the time of the beginning of the Black Death. So that, in fact, at the end of their article, they announced triumphantly, we believe that we can end the controversy. Medieval Black Death was planned. Between 2000 and now, six more studies of this type announcing positive results for Yersinia have been published. Two more by the same team from Marseille, but more important for us, I think, four others from four completely different European labs. I want to just mention briefly, first of all, they had uh, a number of skeletons that had been found 20 years before uh, in a mass grave. And uh, the archaeologists had dated the site where they came from as being in the late 14th century, so being from the time of the beginning of the Black Death. They also had uh, skeletons who had been taken out of the ground quite recently from a place uh, right close to the latter half of the 6th century. Being familiar with the work of the Marseille group, they saw their chance, why not? try it and test these subjects. They were extraordinarily successful because they found uh, the presence of Yersinia both in uh, the uh, 14th century skeletons, teeth of the skeletons, and similarly for those of the 6th century. In the first place, we note that they replicated the methodology developed by the people in Marseille. So nobody else could say, as had been said by a number of people, well, you know, they probably, you know, the laboratory was in Marseille, was con contaminated, DNA is very difficult to control, and so we can't take it seriously until it's been replicated elsewhere. Okay, that's taken care of. And furthermore, they pushed back uh, the date now to the pandemic of Justinian, to the 6th century. But there's more to these results, and it's more important, potentially at least, for us in our argument. All of the sites that are mentioned in the articles published from 1998 to 2010 are in places where plague was already believed to have been present based on historical sources all except for that 6th century site near Munich. There are no written sources that tell us that plague was present anywhere in Bavaria in the 6th century. And therefore, whereas the molecular biologists in all the previous cases, and the Munich people themselves in dealing with those, those 14th century remains, what had they been doing? They had been corroborating what historians already claimed to know. But in this latter case, the one that comes from the 6th century, they extended on the basis purely of examining without any strict historical information. They expanded the um, known geographical spread of the first plague pandemic. Now, if we can sort of move out of this, what we call a paleopathology lab, and just cross the hall over to the molecular genetics lab. There, the major breakthroughs uh, in the late 20th century have provided the tools for constructing the evolutionary history of plague. So a large uh, international team based largely in Berlin and the Pasteur Institute in Paris in 1999, put forth their analysis of the genetic structure of Yersinia pestis. And they found that it had evolved away from two distant ancestors, which by the way are both quite benign, 
they, they are diseases that cause moderate and short-lived discomfort, uh, but show nothing of the high toxicity of Yersinia pestis. And their conclusion is that Yersinia is a recently emerged clone of these earlier uh, diseases, having evolved uh, between 1,500 and 20,000 years ago, recently emerged. 20,000 comes in under that uh, designation. And uh, two years later, a large consortium of English scientists produced the first complete genome directory of the genetic makeup of Yersinia. At the end of last October, so we're going back only three months, Another study appeared by again, a very large international group, made up largely of geneticists. They were able to construct a historical geography that traces Yersinia from its origins to all the various places on Earth where it is now known to be present. In fact, the method they chose was to start with all the known living strains of Yersinia in the world today and to work back from these many branches to the main trunk and roots of the bacteria's family tree. What we learned from their results is that the place where all this began was China. Even though the authors qualify the location in some notably cautious phrases, Yersinia pestis probably evolved in China, and Yersinia's, quote, global evolutionary history originated in the vicinity of China. Let's just call it East Asia. Let go at that. There is no contradiction between this conclusion and the texts that document the two earlier world pandemics of plague. The linking of Eurasia, referred to earlier uh, by the Mongols, uh, from the Pacific Ocean to the Black Sea guaranteed the rapid spread of the second pandemic from Central Asia to Europe and the Middle East over that, uh, that northern route that I re referred to uh, before. Only the immediate provenance of the first pandemic remains unresolved. And so we go back to that notion that the disease arrived in 541, and nobody knows uh, how it got there uh, and where it could have come from. That is to say, we do not have texts that give an indication uh, whether it had come uh, overland to there from somewhere, uh, whether it had in fact come up through the Red Sea, but if it did, uh, you know, had it come from uh, somewhere else. A reminder that, uh, after all, it is uh, entirely possible um, that uh, this uh, sea route uh, would have brought it uh, to, uh, to India uh, and moved on. Um, the map doesn't indicate this, but uh, it seems to me as it could as, as well uh, have uh, indicated the possibility of stopping in, in East Africa uh, to somehow explain that in any case uh, it would eventually be able to come up this way. And it's basically right where the Suez Canal uh, you know, lets up. Now, for all we know, uh, the, the disease could have been on its first trip westward in the 6th century. Uh, but um, it could perfectly as well have long since uh, traveled from China to India, uh, or Africa, or indeed uh, uh, to both. Uh, that's one way uh, it could have gotten there. Um, and the map does suggest, after all, that um, the sort of main central artery of this uh, does come in so close uh, to uh, the point I've indicated several times of losing uh, that uh, 
until we know better, uh, why not say it, it could also have come by uh, land. As for where the pandemic, the first one, spread to, if we think about the way it spread to the east, we have clear documentation that it affected the Persian Empire. And then there's a sort of blackout. So our best indication, and all people who've ever worked on this, there aren't many, but those who've worked on this first pandemic just see it here as moving in this direction. Except that a few historians tell us that the Justinian pandemic reached all the way to China in the year 610. And even that that marked the moment when plague made its first appearance in that land. The source, which is authoritatively dated 610, contains a brief description of disease symptoms that include fever and chills, a very brief illness before death, and above all, lumps under the skin that range in size between a bean and a plum. That's not bad. Uh, there's no mention, though, of where these lumps might be placed on the body. That, that's the element, I suppose, that's missing if we really wanted to say that this must be bubonic plague. But it, it, nothing that it does include um, excludes the possibility. My colleagues who, though, have made this claim about the year 610 had really looked, had better look a little more carefully at the material. It is not in a historical account that tells anything about what happened in 610. Instead, it's an encyclopedic compendium of medical knowledge, a kind of grand you know, collection of material. And the section that includes this description, which looks like plague, essentially has been lifted from a 3rd century BC medical encyclopedia. So it is certainly not proof that the plague of Justinian traveled from the Mediterranean region to China in 610. What Chinese sources do contain are numerous references to years in which there were epidemics of deadly diseases. A list of these years has been published. It doesn't make very exciting reading because uh, it contains 400 numbers. There are lists, but they're years. And they range from Third, the, the third century BC until the 20th century AD. So, you know, all these years, and we read down to it, well, could this have been? These all come from Chinese dynastic histories. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us that this genre of writing, like any other, had its conventions. Some of the dynastic histories report that an epidemic took place. Some add the region where it took place. Some give an estimate of the number of victims, and so on. But one thing is absolutely consistent about these four different accounts of 400 years in which there were epidemics. They do not include descriptions of symptoms. So we don't really know. If the geneticists are right that Yersinia pestis first evolved in or near China, we can reasonably expect that there were epidemics of plague in that land, not simply before 541 AD, but possibly even centuries before that. But given the state of Chinese written sources, if we ask Chinese historians, if there was ever plague in China, do we expect them just to throw up their hands and shrug their shoulders and say, we'll never know? Some of them may respond in that way, but those with whom I've been in correspondence recently report that attempts at locating the plague pathogen in the teeth of human skeletons found by archaeologists have already been made. Chinese molecular paleopathologists have not reported any positive findings so far. But stay tuned. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Little. Um, Professor Little has agreed to answer questions. I mean, you, you've ranged widely across archaeology and history here. I think, uh, as a, someone who's worked a lot on the 6th century, are there not other, um, other evidences? There are so many burials from the middle of the 6th century, from Italy, from Greece, from Turkey, that are so tempting to associate with this, uh, with this uh, plague that you were describing. And not least, well, there is a famous burial in the Silk Road, Yinkenna, that we have heard much about uh, in previous lectures, who's associated with Assyrian glass of the 5th century. So there are all sorts of, uh, it is a period rich with opportunity for archaeologists to test your teeth. I wonder if you thought about that. Uh, well, uh, Mike McCormick of Harvard is assembling a, a, a directory or repertory of, of uh, sites uh, or, or simply of remains that perhaps even are already in, in collections uh, that uh, are sufficiently close in time so that they could uh, present suitable material. Um, the uh, desirable uh, circumstances of for finding these, of course, uh, as always, are plague pits. Uh, that is, this, this is the real tip-off that we're talking about an epidemic of some disease. When there are the social uh, and cultural formalities of funerals that are simply abandoned because so many people are dying so fast uh, that the bodies are just uh, just uh, tossed in. But um, I should add that, uh, as everyone present knows, uh, archaeology is a very expensive and time-consuming uh, science. And, um, of course, there's additional expense added on uh, if one is going to get uh, all of one's you know, colleagues in the lab coats uh, to work on yet. There are some interesting developments just in this past decade, even there, in which uh, there may be uh, much simpler ways of doing this test. Uh, so that uh, there's been one report from a German group uh, of using a dipstick. And uh, it was developed in Madagascar for diagnosing people with plague. Uh, but these people said, all right, let's see if we can use it with ancient remains. They claim to have done it. Um, there's a case I think where not everybody is yet convinced. Uh, could we